That lights come on in. Is that a
It is the story of a people who had everything. They wanted something else and ended up with nothing. And I say we've done that a lot of times. We were not pleased with what God gave us and we began to grumble and complain. The first thing you know, we wound up with nothing. When Israel was walking with the Lord, they were not interested in the world's message. And I'll say that this morning to you. As long as we walk with God, we walk hand in hand with Him, and we walk in His footsteps, then the world's methods don't bother us. But it's when we get out of the will of God and start walking in our own ways, according to our own mind and our own heart, that we begin to look on the things of the world and desire things that would be a hurt to us in our Christian walk. And that's what happened to them. But when they grew carnal, say carnal, uh -huh. the word says that a carnal mind is what? Enmity. Enmity to God. A carnal mind is nothing more than just a natural understanding. A sinful mind that we were born with. We were born in sin and shaping in iniquity. We have to have a change of mind, a change of heart. Anytime we let our natural mind, our earthly mind, start rooting, <coughs> rooting over us, then we get in trouble. That's why he said, having you the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. And in the 12th chapter of Romans, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by what? Yeah. The renewing of your mind. Our mind has to be renewed in God every day, every day. We must have a personal relationship with God in order to walk with Him. Some of us sitting here this morning, some of you, have never had a personal relationship with God. Until you have had that personal experience with Him, personal relationship with God, you don't know Him. You don't know Him. There has to be a communion, Sister Betty. There has to be a relationship between you and God in order to know Him. You cannot know Him without having a mind that's been changed, a heart that's been changed, and one that has its mind set toward God. You cannot understand the things of God with a carnal mind. Your mind has to be changed. You must put on a new mind. Put on the mind of Christ that we might understand his way and understand how that God wants us to live. They had gone back into carnality, into their natural understanding, their natural mind. They had left the mind of the Lord and following God by the mind of the Lord and gone back into their own carnal understanding. So therefore, they begin to look on the world. And they said, we want what the world's got. We want what the other nations have got. We want a king. Here you've gotten old, and we need a king. He was talking at that time, I believe it was to Eli, and to Samuel, excuse me, to Samuel, that you've gotten old, and they're your sons. They're not following after God. They're not walking in your way. We need a king to judge us and to rule over us. And so therefore their carnality called them not only to reject Samuel as an effective leader, but to reject the Lord their God. See, any time that God sets a man over you to rule over you, to lead you, not just to rule over you, but to lead you in the ways of God, and you get weary of his ruling or leadership, you begin to mutter and complain and, uh, and uh, be dissatisfied with what God has given you, and you begin to reject that one that God has set over you, the Lord said, they're not just rejecting you, Samuel, said so they're rejecting me. When you reject God's authority and leadership that he's put over you, then you're rejecting God. And that's exactly what happened to these people. They had not just rejected Samuel, but they had rejected God. We need to understand that this morning. Be careful how you talk about the man of God. Be careful how you reject him. Be careful of your attitude toward the man of God. Because you're not just rejecting him, but you're 
rejecting God, do you reject that one that God has set over you to lead you and guide you? You're rejecting God himself. Then the prophet Samuel was the miracle son of Elkanah and Hannah, an insignificant couple of the Mount of Ephraim area. God gave Samuel to Hannah when she refused to be discouraged by adversaries' provocation because she was barren. She refused to be denied by the Almighty's promise. She was a believing woman. The story of Samuel is the story of a good prophet, sandwiched between a questionable priest and a bad king. The saga of Samuel is also a story of a circuit riding judge and an ephod wearing priest. On the one hand, he was trying to get Israel to discern between right and wrong. And on the other hand, he was trying to get them to meet with God at the altar. And then he'll lead you to an altar. Praise the Lord. Samuel was a prophet who was born soon enough to save Israel from calamity, but who died too soon to save them from captivity. He called them to repent, but he not, could not get them to retain their walk with God. And I say this, that I've seen many a man of God, preacher, preach the truth of God's word, cause people to come to an altar and repent of their sin. But as far as getting them to walk with God, that was another story. It wasn't hard to get them to repent, but to walk with God was another story. A real man of God will do everything in his power that God will allow him to do to cause you to walk with God. He'll point out your shortcomings. He'll point out your faults. And he'll let you know the direction you're going in. Sometimes we don't like it. Sometimes we think he's minding our business. He's being nosy. But the man that God set over you to watch after your soul is obligated in every way that God will allow him to lead you into a truth that will cause you to walk with God every day. Every day. Walk with God. Hallelujah. The story should teach us first that God's will is always best. God's will is always best. Our ways are never the best, but God's will is always best for our life. Secondly, it should teach us that if we press Him, I said we need to press God. Hallelujah. If we press Him, keep seeking, keep knocking, and keep asking, don't give up. Hallelujah. Then God is going to hear the cries of his people and come to our rescue. He always has. He always has. Praise the Lord. If we press him without seeking his divine will, he'll give us what we're asking. Whether it be good, whether it be bad. God will allow you. He said, choose you this day. God will not make you do anything. God will make you live right. Now, Sister Copeland, I used to think when I first started out for God and I had the Holy Ghost that there was a lot of things in my life that was wrong. And I just expected God would just take those things out of my life without any effort on my own. Just take them away from me, see? And not let me do those things. But I found out after a while, after falling so many times, I found out that God gave me the power that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you to choose whether or not I wanted to live for God or not. God will not make you live right. He will not make you. He will let you have your way if you insist. Just like he did these people. They insisted. They pressed him. So, you say, well, they weren't really straight pressing God. They were pressing Sam. What did I tell you in the beginning? He said, they're not doing this unto you. They're doing it unto me. The same as you do unto the man of God, you do unto God himself. As you've done this unto the least of one of these, my little ones, then you've done it also unto me. He may give us what we're asking to teach us a lesson. There's times that I've asked God for things that I, I absolutely 
did not need, that I didn't need, that would do me hurt. But because I kept asking, oh, I felt like I had to have a certain thing. And I kept asking God. First thing you know, he let me have my way all right. But it was to teach me a lesson. Teach me a lesson. God will teach you a lesson by allowing you to have your way so that you might see that there's a right way. They taught him in the, uh, the Marines that there's a right way and there's a wrong way and then there's the Marines way. But God's way is always the best. Praise the Lord. He was used as king to lead Israel into spiritual and economic chaos. The people of Israel cried out to the Lord, but it was too late. It was too late. You say it's never too late as long as there's bread. It's never too late. But I'm saying to you today, you can cry out to God too late. There is a running out period. There's a grace period, but there's a time when God's grace runs out. And God may get tired of fooling with us if we continue to have our way. The prophet's dedication. <laughs> Samuel's life, the birth and the childhood of Samuel. Samuel's life was no less spectacular than his birth. His birth was the answer of a promise that God gave to his mother Hannah. Her desperation for a son caused her to attract not only the attention of God, but also the attention of Levi the priest. Hannah was a woman that desired a child. It was a reproach to her because she was barren. She couldn't bear children. And it became a reproach to her. And she began to cry out. Cry out to God. And I'm telling you folks this morning, it's a reproach when we become barren and we don't see people, children born into the kingdom of God, it's a reproach to us. But thank God, she was a woman of faith. And she believed God for his promises and she held him to his word. I'm telling you, when you hold God to his word, God will answer every time. We should know Hannah's seven steps to bearing a son. There were seven things that she did that caught God's attention and caused God to give her a son. First, she went to the house of God. Now, I want you to see a story, a picture in what I'm about to tell you of the church. She went to the house of God. The word of God said, fail not to assemble yourselves together. God wants you to come to his house to worship him. To worship him. She could have probably prayed at home just as well as she did at church, she thought. But there was something in her that moved on her to cause her to go to the house of God to pray. She went to the house of God. And next, she wept so. She wept so. She had a desire in her heart that she wanted to bear a child. She wanted a man child. And until this church gets that desire in their heart to be unbearable, to be fruitful, and to multiply, Amen. to bring forth children unto God, there has to be a desire in the house of God. Hallelujah. We have got to get down to the place to where we're going to uh, be willing to put forth a little suffering, and a little effort. It bothers me. I tell you, it bothers me. When I come to the house of God and I see people come to these altars seeking the Holy Ghost, seeking for God to come on the inside of their life and take up in the boat and lead them. And they go away unfulfilled. It bothers me. There's something about being barren that bothers me. I want to see children born into the kingdom of God in these altars. Hallelujah. That's what we're here for. That's what it's all about. We're not just gathered in this place to have a good meeting. We're not just gathered here unto our own self to teach Sister 
bring forth a son. And until we get that sore feeling, until we weep till there's no more tears in our eyes to weep, until we get to the place and we're still, we say, God, you've got to do something for us. Get hungry to see God move. We'll have barren altars. We'll have barren altars. But when we get to the place and when we see that we need something from God ourselves, and we begin to pray and weep, hallelujah, God will not pass us by. And another thing she did, she fasted. She fasted. Sometimes you might think I talk about that too much, but I know the effect. I know the effect. Fasting and praying and seeking God, I've seen God move, and you have too. When we humble ourselves in fasting, when we begin to pray and seek God, and God begins to move. Hallelujah. It's only if you think God don't know what's in our hearts, God is going to hold blessing, withhold blessing from us if we don't fast and pray and seek him. And when we begin to fast and we begin to pray, we begin to cry to God and be in agony with him. Most people don't like to suffer. Hardly anybody likes to suffer. I don't, see, I don't know of anybody really that enjoys it. But sometimes it's necessary for God's will to be done. She fasted. She refrained herself from eating. She wouldn't eat. She wanted God's attention. She fasted. She humbled herself. Sometimes we get so high-minded and so carried away with our own self and what we're doing until we get proud-hearted and humble in order for us to humble ourselves. The Bible said to humble yourself. Now, God can humble you if you refuse to humble yourself. God's got ways. Hallelujah. God's got ways of humbling you and bringing you down. Right. Praise the Lord. But God's desire and will is that we humble ourselves. It's so much easier when we learn to humble ourselves. Learn how to fast. If you want action from God, then you've got to learn how to fast and pray and weep some tears. Weep some tears. Shed some tears over a lost world. Jesus himself, God, looked out over the city of Jerusalem and wept. We've got to shed some tears in order to have children born into the kingdom of God. She fasted. She wept. She grieved. She grieved. Now you notice she brought all of this on herself. God wasn't making her do this. But she did it on her own. She was so desired, so desired to have children, to have a son, that she grieved herself. She went to the church and she prayed and she fasted and she cried. And she grieved. She grieved. She had bitterness of soul. She was desperate. I went to God today that we would get desperate before God. Get desperate to see people brought to God and see people saved. She prayed. <laughs> she prayed. I don't know how long she prayed. <coughs> But I imagine she prayed till she got her answer. Hallelujah. I imagine that most of us spent most, more time, some of us, I say this, not all of us, some of us, probably spent more time brushing our teeth this morning than we did praying all week. That's a shame. That's a disgrace to God's people. We need to learn how to pray. Learn how to seek God. There's something in this besides just coming to church on Sunday and Wednesday and singing a song and 
bow your head when somebody else prays. There's some seeking God you got to do. There's some seeking God I've got to do. If I'm going to be a part of the kingdom of God, then there's some things that I've got to do to keep myself in condition for God to hear me. Sister Copeland, I have got to make some sacrifices in order for God to hear me. Just like Hannah did. She was a woman of faith. She believed that God was going to do just what he said he would do. And she set out to get it. She set out to get her heart's desire. Hallelujah. You make up your mind. God, whatever it takes, I'm going to do what I have to do. And your desire ought to be to see souls one to God. That ought to be our first priority. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is not pleased with people just coming to church, bringing their own self, and never inviting anybody, never talking to anybody that's lost about their soul. God wants to see people saved. And next, after she prayed, she did something else. She vowed. She made a vow to God. What was the vow that she made? Does anybody know? Did she do what? That she would give it back to God. <coughs> next, she did. She kept her vow. She kept her vow. Thinking she was drunk. She had gotten in such a state, in such agony, in such pain and praying. Now, I know there's a lot of churches that they don't go along with this. They think all you got to do is just say a little prayer in your heart. And it's good to pray in your heart. A little silent prayer. And when you go to your meals and you pray a little bit and you thank God for your food and at night you get down on your knees and ask God to keep you safe through the night. Now, those kind of prayers are good. But this kind of prayer that Hannah prayed was not one of those kinds. She was desperate. And she prayed until she got a hold of God. And here comes Eli, the priest. See, he lived in the, in, the, in the church or in the temple. He lived there. That was his home. And he'd probably been watching her, and he thought she was drunk. Now, she must have been out of normal uh, for a good bit in order for him to think she was drunk. And I remember another bunch that they thought were drunk. On the day of Pentecost, you remember when they received the Holy Ghost and God come down and baptized them with the Holy Ghost? And men and people thought they were drunk. They said, we're not drunk like you suppose, see, it's but the ninth hour or third hour of the day. We're not drunk like you suppose. She was probably drunk all right, but it wasn't on fermented fruit juice. It was, she was drunk on the Spirit of God and on the, uh, her prayer and on her desire for God to do something for her. Thinking she was intoxicated because of her actions in the house of God. Can you imagine? How that some folks might think about us. Now this morning we'd be perfectly in order. Because everybody slept so nice and quiet and they were slept. But sometimes when God really begins to move in our service, if somebody comes in that don't understand the move of God and how God moves on his people sometimes, they think we was all drunk or crazy. They'd have been up down at the church a few weeks ago, they'd probably thought we was all crazy or drunk. God has always caused his people to do strange things. <laughs> Praise the Lord. When God's people get desperate, they begin to cry to see God. They vex their own soul in order for God to answer their prayer. He thought she was drunk because of her actions in the house of God, and she pleaded for a son. And Eli rebuked her. He rebuked her. But when Eli saw that she was not intoxicated, he gave her assurance. He saw that she wasn't drunk. 
and he gave her assurance. And it was Eli that said, go in peace. Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Praise the Lord. He assured her that God was going to answer her prayer. God had seen her groaning. He had seen her tears. He had seen all the time, hours, probably maybe days, that she had spent in the house of God, praying and seeking God. He had saw how that she fasted until she probably lost a lot of weight and become weak, how that her soul was grieved because of the desire that she had in her and how desperate she was. He heard her prayer. She prayed until she had no more words. How many of us, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, have prayed until we had no more voice to pray with? Only her lips was moving, but she had no more voice. Oh, God, give us a desire in our heart, Lord Jesus, to see souls saved, to see sons and daughters born into the kingdom of God, until we pray, until there's no more words. Hallelujah. I wish we could see a move of God like that around here. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. When people come into the house of God and stay until they got there, sure that God was going to answer. But son, she, re she conceived and bare a son, whom she called Samuel, which means ask of the Lord. After Samuel was weaned, she kept her promise. She took him to the house of God. There was Eli the priest, and she left her son in the house of God, and he was raised there in God's house. She visited him, she probably prayed for him, prayed with him. She probably talked to him and taught him, but he was taught by Eli. Hannah took him to the house of God, of the Lord in Shiloh and dedicated him to the Lord. Hallelujah. And we should not do any less for our own children. Take them to the house of God. Have them dedicated when they're born. Teach them the ways of God. Teach them in the morning when they get up. Teach them at night before they go to bed. All during the day. <coughs> Teach them. This is the word of God. Teach them. Tell them who Jesus is. From the time they get up till they go to bed, make sure that they know who Jesus is so that when they get older, they won't be misled and carried away to serve false gods, to serve pagan gods and false gods and wander out of the way of understanding and truth. Teach them who Jesus is. Make sure they know, hallelujah, that they won't be deceived and led away in the false doctrine when they get old. I've heard of kids that was raised to know who Jesus is. I'm talking about in a one God church. There's only one God. How many know that there's one God? I don't anywhere that there was three. There's three manifestations, but not three gods. Amen. There has never been, never will be, but one true God never have been. Now he was manifested as father. He was manifested as son and Holy Ghost. But that don't mean there's three gods. There's only one God. All through the Old Testament. Read the book of Isaiah and you'll find out. He said there is no other God beside me. Yea, is there a Savior? There is no God. There's none beside me. I have neither sister or brother. Hallelujah. There is no God. There was none formed before me. And he said, neither will there be after me. I am the Lord thy God. Hallelujah. Amen. There is only one God. The Bible only speaks of one God. Amen. It's our carnal mind, men's carnal mind, that take the word out of context and let that carnal mind begin to work that conjures up three. It's false doctrine, folks. It's false. There never has been but one God. And I say this this morning on the authority of God's Word, and the Word of God will back me up and say this. Anybody that teaches the 
that there's more than one God and then false doctrine. Amen. That's right. right. They tell you there's three. They're in false doctrine. Amen. On the authority of God's word, I say this. The Bible does not teach but one. Teacher of children that there's only one, <clears throat> one God. He said, teach it to them in the morning when they get up. Teach it to them through the day when they sit down to eat, when they lie down to go to bed. Whenever they're awake, be teaching it to them. Because to know him is eternal life. When you serve more than one God, now the Bible said that there's God's many and Lord's many, but to us that believe, there's how many? There's one. That's why we're called one then. We believe in one. One faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God, one Father. Hallelujah. It's above all through all the hands of God. We've got it. Hallelujah. There's only one God. Teach it to your children. And I'm sure that that's what Samuel was taught. He was taught the ways of God. He was taught that there was only one God. There was only one Lord. You know, the heathens, they, they worship more than one God. And you'll notice in the word God, when it mentions their worship, it, it, their God is mentioned with a small letter, not capitalized. And it's always God, the G-O-D-S. <coughs> you'll notice that. There is only one Lord. There is one God. Three manifestations of one God. See, you must believe this in order to be saved. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. There's only one, and you have to believe that in order to be saved. To know him is eternal life. Hannah returned home rejoicing that God was to grant her request. Soon she conceived and bare a son, whom she called Samuel. Because he was asked of the Lord, she asked God for him and he gave it to her. For this child I prayed, she said, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord, the Lord, there, the L-O-R-D-1. Daniel's childhood was spent ministering before the Lord and assisting the aging Eli in the house of God. And in Samuel 1, 2, 18, 26, but Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child. You see, the hand of God was on this boy's life, even before he was born. And being a child, he worked for God. He did a work for God. He ministered before the Lord as a child. He girded, he was girded with a linen ephah, ephah. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. During the time of Samuel's early development or childhood, Eli permitted his evil son. He had some boys that didn't know God. They were evil. And they were allowed uh, to do things in the house of God that was ungodly. They were not restrained by their father. He was an old man. And he had these two sons, and Hephni and Phineas, to continue in their functions as priests. They knew not the law, yet they were priests. They were priests. In our day, they'd be called preachers. They were priests, but they didn't know God. They had all the appearance. They had on the, the priestly garments. They was in the house of God. They knew about the Lord, but they didn't know him. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of priests in these synagogues and in these churches today. They have all the appearance. They have the tongue that speaks of him, just like these wicked boys did. And they had on their priestly garments, but they didn't know God. The world is full of preachers like that today. They had them back in that day, and they've got them today. They don't know God. 
The Bible said that these boys didn't know God. They were priests. They didn't know God. As a result, Israel lost respect for the sacrifice. <coughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And Eli's sons followed the, the ways of the world. They committed fornication at the door of the church, and they was not restrained by their father for doing it, but they was allowed to do these things. And because of this, the people saw this, and they knew that Eli was an old man now. He done got old. And they knew that his boys was wicked, and they wanted somebody else to lead them, and they began to cry out. Cry out for God to give them a king to worship, I mean, to rule over them. And it's amazing to me sometimes how that people had rather have the flesh to rule over them than they had God. They wanted a natural king. They wanted their kingdom set up. And they wanted somebody to rule over them. And Samuel, after he came on the scene, he was grieved about this. He was a he was in the house of God, and God began to deal with Samuel as he was there in the house of God. And God began to talk to him. He didn't recognize it was God. A lot of times the Lord will begin to talk to us, and we don't recognize it as being God. We think it's just a man. And he thought it was Eli talking to him. And the Lord called his name and said, Samuel, Samuel thought it was Eli, and he said, here I am. And he went to the, got up and went to see what Eli wanted, and Eli said, well, I hadn't called him. So he heard it again, Samuel. So he got up and went again. And Eli said, I didn't call you. And he went the third time. By that time, the old man had woke up. And he realized it must have been the Lord talking to Sam. And he told him, he said, that's the Lord talking to you. I haven't called you. That was the Lord talking to you. He said, you go back to bed. He said, when he talks to you again, then you say, hear my Lord speak, for thy servant hears. Praise the Lord. So the next time that God spoke to Samuel, he said, he obeyed the man of God. He obeyed Eli. And he said, hear my Lord, speak for thy servant here. And God began to talk to Sam. And he showed him something that was going to happen. And he showed him that Eli and his sons was going to be moved out of the way. And that Israel was going to have a king. And he showed him the thing that that king was going to do and how that he was going to take rule over the people and bring them into captivity and put them in bondage. And he began to warn the people about this. How that Samuel, uh, I mean, Eli's sons was going to be moved out of the way in one day. You know God, when he does the work, he does a quick work. And he told him, said, your sons are bold going to die in one day. And it happened, just like he said. And the next day, I imagine it was the next day, I don't know if it was then, I, I forgot if Eli come back to his room that night, or I believe it was the next day, he began to talk to Samuel. And he said, Samuel, tell me, tell me, what did the Lord say to you? And Samuel feared God. And I imagine he was kind of reluctant and he didn't want to tell Eli because, see, Eli had raised him. And he had been raised right there with him and he had taught him and cared for him. And I imagine it was kind of hard for him to tell him the truth. And sometimes it's hard for a man of God to tell you. Sometimes we've had people that Brother Edward Tan to come to him and say, just tell me, what do you think is my problem? What do you think is wrong Sometimes it was hard for him to come out and tell them the truth, what God had showed him about them. And a lot of times people have not been willing to accept what God had showed him about them, and they've just walked 
walked away and walked off and went on their own way, not listening to the man of God. But then there's times when things wasn't that pleasant. He didn't have a good report to bring them, but he began to tell them what God had showed them, and they weren't willing to accept that. It hurt. But nevertheless, Eli said, whatever he said to you, tell me. I want to know. A person that's really honest and wants to know what God uh, thinks about the situation, <coughs> they'll say, tell me. I want to know. Whatever it is, if it's bad or if it's good, I want to know. Tell me the truth. Amen. Tell me the truth. And we've got a lot of preachers that won't tell you the truth. They'll butter you up and they'll smooth you over and make you think you're all right. Samuel could have done that, but he feared God. Thank God we've still got some preachers that fear God today, Sister Debbie, that will tell us the truth. Hallelujah. Even if it hurts, and it hurts Samuel, he didn't want to tell him what Eli, what God had told him about Eli. But nevertheless, he told him. And it wasn't good news in his ears. It's not always good news that God brings. Every prophecy is not good news. You remember the folks that said, prophesy to us smooth things. And there's a lot of people that will go to preachers that's in it for money. I said there's a lot of them in it for money. They're in the ministry for money. Most of these tell me, I say, I'm better not. These television preachers, you know what they're in for? Money. And they'll tell, tell you anything you want to hear. They'll prophesy smooth things to your ears. You can be living like the devil, and they'll tell you, man, you're a saint of God, and, and God's fixing to really use you. And make you think you're the most high and chosen one of God, you better be careful what you listen to. They said, tell me the truth. Eli said, I want to know the truth. Praise God, I want to know the truth. If it hurts, it hurts. If the shoe fits, wear it, but tell me the truth. Hallelujah. If I'm wrong, somebody tell me now. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't wait. Don't wait till it's too late for me to do anything about it and then tell me. A person that will do that don't love your soul. They don't love you. Yeah. A person that won't tell you the truth and tell you like it is. Tell you that you've got to repent of your sin. Be baptized in Jesus' name and receive the Holy Ghost in your life with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and live a godly, holy, clean, righteous life before God. If they don't tell you that, they don't love you. Amen. Now there's a lot of preachers standing in pulpits this morning preaching smooth things. They've got people thinking they're all right. Everything is all right. You just come on to church, bring your money with you, and you'll be all right. That's preaching lies for filthy lucre's sake. They won't tell you what sin is. They won't let you know what the Bible says about sin. They won't tell it like it is. A man of God that loves you, they're going to tell it like it is. Hallelujah. And if it hurts, let it hurt. Praise God. Call sin, sin. Tell you it's abomination in the sight of God for a woman to put on that pertaining to a man. Tell you that there's things in your life. There's hatred, there's jealousy, there's fornication, and there's all kind of lust and all kind of spirits in here. That if you don't get rid of it, they'll take you to hell. You don't hear them mention that. They'll talk about love. Love, love, love. That's about all they want to talk about. But I'm telling you, there's something to talk about besides love. Hey. God is love. God is love. Brother Mangum said there's a man come to him and said, you preach too hard that you ought to preach more about love. We believe in just preaching about love. God is love. He said, yeah, God is love. But 
If you love God, then you're going to tell the truth. Hallelujah. I love God and I love His truth. And I love righteousness and I love holiness. There's some things that you've got to love, but there's some things that you've got to turn loose of. Amen. Praise God. There's some spirits on the inside of you that God needs to clean out before you can have the real love of God. Hallelujah. There's some wickedness in our lives that God, only Him, can come in and destroy. The Bible said, love not the world. It's good to love. Praise God, I love to hear a good message of love. I love for somebody to preach to me sometimes and, and uh, make me feel good, make me feel like I'm living right. But then there's things in my life when a preacher gets up to preach, maybe I hadn't even noticed it being there. Maybe I had not even had my attention called to it yet. But when a man of God can stand in a pulpit and preach to me and show me my faults and show me what's wrong, there's a man that loves. There's a man who loves me. He loves me enough that he's going to point out my wrongdoing in order that I might get delivered, that I might go to hell. Hallelujah. A person that don't love you will let you sit in the audience. A congregation like this, they'll let you sit there in your sin and preach love to you and good things and have a beautiful service. Man, you're talking about a ceremony in the service. They can have one. They can have one. They can put on one. They can, they got programs that will outdo us any day as far as programs is concerned. But when it comes to telling you the truth, you better find a man of God that's going to be honest with you, just like Samuel was to Eli. He said, Eli, there's some things that you've got to know. I've got to tell you these things. They hurt me. I don't really want to tell you. But I've got to tell you the truth. And he began to tell him what was going to happen. He began to show him what was going to happen. He said, you are going to be removed. You and your whole family is going to be removed from this kingdom, this priesthood. There's going to be a king because the people have asked for a king. There's going to be a king given, and he's going to rule, and he's going to uh, he's going to bring in captivity. He's going to bring his people into captivity. He began to tell him what was going to take place. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. But Eli said, "Tell, tell me. I want to know. Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth." Praise the Lord. And they begin to demand the king. And God gives them one. Praise the Lord. And I'm not going to have time to get in there, so I'm going to have to quit. But I want you to know one thing. It's better to have the will of God than it is your own desire. If you begin to desire something, God will give you that you desire. It was not his will to have a king ruling over his people. It was his will to, for the people to obey the prophet that he had sent to the priest to obey all they want. They begin to see after a while that their desire was not right. And they begin to cry out to God. But it was too late. And another thing that I want to bring about before I leave.
takes commitment. When you love, just like in a family type of love. People that say, I love you, I love you, and they're not committed to one another, don't really, there's not the deep love that should be there. And that's where the love comes in, and that's where, that's where even a lot of times it, pressure comes down hard on a lot of things that sin in people's lives, because he knows there's that sin there, and they're not totally committed to God. And that's, that, that's where it's at. You've got to be committed, and that's where it's, the commitment shows the love to God. If we was commit, as committed to, to God as God is to us, we wouldn't have any problems with love. Praise the Lord. Let's sing that song. Praise the Lord.
Amen. You hear the motor of a car running because there's something taking place under the hood. <laughs> Praise God. Something's taking place under the hood. Praise the Lord. Say this morning, I appreciate all of you really got a year at work where we could have a service here this morning. We're really not supposed we, we just had to, we had to eat away. We're not completely finished with the building, but we are going to finish it. We've got a lot of painting to do, the doors, different things, tape, tape rooms all fixed, outside. But I'll tell you, this is a long ways from the little house down yonder to Mr. Potty. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Amen. This is a long ways from, uh, what, what do we call it? Uh, uh, chipboard Mr. Potty. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But thank God. He, he loves us. This is a dream come true. We're, uh, <clears throat> we're going to work. As we always have, and we're going to try to finish up the building inside and outside. We're hoping by spring of the year that uh, it'll be beautiful around here. We're hoping to have some flowers blooming, and some young trees put around, some dogwoods. And uh, we are going to have a dedication service after the building is completely done and we have our uh, certificate of occupancy. Then we are going to have a special dedicated service dedication service and I may do it a little different from what the others do because I I guess I'm a renegade preacher or something like that I don't know but I just I don't believe in just letting let people work like dogs on the church and then call in somebody that had nothing to do it from 100 miles off to come in and preach dedication services and all like that we got some preachers in this place I said we got some Brother Coleman here, Brother uh, Tim Thompson has stood with me. May I tell you, they stood with this church. I won't say me, I, but I just consider that because you're my brother. But you, you stood with the church in different places. I know you have. These are men that you can count on. They might not be eloquent speakers like some of them who get up and say, uh huh, here he comes, listen to him. They don't claim to be. They love God. They're trying to win souls. Amen. And I do know that I'm, I'm asking now, right now, Brother Copeland, in, in your presence, and Brother Tim, in this dedication service, I want both of y'all to preach. This morning is not the dedication service. This morning we're just meeting here and having service. But we're going to dedicate the temple. And um, we're going to dedicate it up to the Lord. And I'm going to ask them to be prepared on one day for both of them to preach, and for them to pray, and get a hold of God for what God wants them to say. I believe they'll have something to say to us, don't you? Let me read the scripture to you, and I'll let you sit down. <coughs> and all. In the book of Kings, when. Uh, Solomon had built the temple, the new temple. Before anything else happened, let me read you a scripture. And they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those did the priests and the Levites break up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered or multitude. For the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, 
even under the wings of the cherubims. While the cherubim spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim covered the ark and the stage thereof above. And they drew out the stage at the end of the stage were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and there they are unto this day. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at, his, at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Praise God. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, as we come to you this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your people. We thank you for the church this morning, God. Lord, I ask you in Jesus' name to bless this morning, Lord, as I speak to those people, Lord. Bless me, O oh God, and give me that that you would have me to say this morning, Lord. This flesh would not be in the way, dear God. Use me just as a channel to talk through this morning, Lord, that our people might be inspired and, and encouraged, oh God, because we've, been, we've come a long way, Lord, and we've, we've had some hard battles, Lord, and we've fought the devil all the way. God, we don't plan on quit fighting the devil, but Lord, we need your prayer this morning. We need your help this morning to hear our prayers, Lord. God, touch us this morning. Touch the congregation, we pray. In Jesus' name, we ask you. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. In the reading of the word of the Lord this morning, it was a uh, pre-service. That's what we're having now, pre-service. Before the dedication of the temple. For a long time, Israel had took the ark of the Lord and all the worshiping of the Lord had been done just in a rough tabernacle. <laughs> Up until this time, God had, God had worked in the old tabernacle. I want you to listen to me very carefully. In the old tabernacle, it was built out of badger skins and sticks and had an earthen floor and it was pitched out in the wilderness and it was pitched in such a way that, that they were continually moving from one place to another with no secure place, no place to call home. They were wanderers. They had to wander because they had no place until God gave them a place. They was headed toward the place that God promised. And by vision and by hope, they was looking towards that place. God told them to build a tabernacle, told them how to build a tabernacle, and they built, when we say tabernacle, what we're talking about is a tent. It's a tent. They lived in tents, they dwelt in tents. The church was just a big old tent made out of skin and died. That's all it was. So when the mother talked about kings this morning, when, when the kings began to set up, King David, who took the place of Saul, he had it in his heart. He said, here I live in a beautiful house, a sealed house, and everything, and, and the ark of God is still in the wilderness. We, in other words, David said, I feel ashamed because I fixed everything up for myself and I don't have nothing fixed up for God. That's just the way the whole situation looked. And it was in David's heart, I'm going to build a place. I want a house for my God. I want a house of God. A house for Him. And uh, he began to lay up things. And I thought about it. And I told him some of these things out. I, I, I'm going to tell you, the devil, there were several times the death angel come to me and told me I'd never make this right here. The thing that's going to happen to me and everything else. Somebody else is going to have to finish. I went back to the Word of God and, and uh, I started laying up just like David did. David laid up. David didn't get to finish the house of God. He built the house of God. 
But he laid up and he laid stuff by to build it with. Brother, we, we've had a lot of it rot on us. We've had a lot of it go bad on us. But you look around the trim of this building right here, it come out of another church. Leave my old wood. We saw it. We put it in here. Baseboards. We put it in the trim around this. All this. We brought these lights we brought from another place. Stored them. These pews right here. Stored in the chicken house. Wait. We, we didn't have no church. But we was prepared for it. We laid up for it. Those two swinging doors when you come in. They come out of another church in Jonesboro. They're here. But well, the Bible says every strive brings forth from his treasure something old and something new. So we've got something old and something new. And we get through with knowledge like you. Praise the Lord. That's just the way it is with the Lord. He gets through with us. He makes us a new, don't he? Praise the Lord. They went in tabernacles. And, and, and they, had, they didn't have a place with the ark of God. The ark of God represented, if right now we was looking for a type and a shadow of what the ark of God was, it's the Holy Ghost and the movement and the power of God. There is buildings everywhere that has no God in them. Right. I said they, they don't have no God in them. They got religion. I think some of that was what Mom was talking about. There's places that's got religion that don't have God. No, no, God. God's not there. Well, this Solomon built this temple before the dedication. They didn't attempt to dedicate this building, to pray the dedication prayer, none of these things, until they went to where the God that they had in the wilderness, and they brought him into the humility. They set the ark of God in its place. I want to tell you something. There's a lot of folks don't want to come into a place like this. They want to stay in a place like that. But I want to, I want to leave that goat skin. And I want to leave that badger skin. You hear what I'm talking about? And I want this beautiful place to be for God. And I want the God that worked in that to be brought in here to work in this. Amen. Hallelujah! We've got to bring the ark of God and set it in His place. You know where His place is? Above everybody in here and everything in here. And if the glory of the Lord ever fills this place, It'll be, called, it'll be because that we have brought the ark of God and set it in the oracle of God and in the place of God. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to get on some of you this morning. I don't want you to ever come here and say, say we're going to answer this church. You do God rebuke you in the name of Jesus. This is His church. When I die and leave here, I want it to go on in His church. God put another preacher in here. Put more people in here. It'll go on because this work is dedicated unto the Lord. Sometimes we don't give it his place. That's the reason we don't have the blessings. I read about in your presence just a few minutes ago about they lost something out of the ark before they got it. From the tabernacle into the holy place in the new building that Solomon built. Because when the ark originally had three things in it, do y'all remember me reading that? It had the tables of stone which Moses had put in there. It had Aaron's rod that budded. And it had a pot full of the holy manna that God had felt them with in the wilderness. But from, from the land of Egypt and, and the wilderness into the land of Canaan to the house that Solomon had built for the name of the Lord. When they got the ark there, there was two things that was missing in that ark. One of them was Aaron's rod that budded. And then uh, the reason I believe and I feel like that it was missing because there come a time 
when there had to be a choice between who was going to lead and who was going to be the high priest. And they laid all the rods of all the men out. And one man was chosen because his rod budded and brought forth in one day. And they done that as a memorial. You hear what I'm talking about? When they got to the temple, the only thing left was the tables of stone. And these people served God for places of leadership. They want to see the rod bud. They want to be the chosen ones. There's other people that the only reason they serve God is what they can get from God. But before it was ever set in its rightful place, the bread basket left and the rod left. And the only thing that was left was the Word of God. Right. There's going to come a time when, when the Word of God be for you and your food feed. It's going to be, be more to you than paying your rent. Yeah. It's going to be more to you than, than, than paying your car notes and having an automobile to drive. You look at, you don't worship God because of what he provides. You worship him because he is God. He don't have to have no other reason. Get rid of that thing about I want to be the leader. I want to lay my rod out. I want God to touch my rod. I want it to burn. I want it to be placed alongside. When, when everything got to the one that's in there but the table of the stars, which was the word of God and the commandments of God, and that was all that was left. When we get God in his rightful place, when we put him where the oracle is, we go before the Lord and we look at him in his rightful place. And look at the ark, just like the ark of the Lord was in this building. When God is in his right, rightful place here, we won't come to this church just to seek bread. We won't come to this church just to seek a place of leadership, of being high, of being lifted up. Lo, here am I. We'll come to this place because we have a hunger for the table of stone. For the word that was wrote for the finger of God. Brother, that's where the glory is. That's where the praise is. That's where the worship is. When God means more to you than anything else. Amen. That's his place. We put pictures all over the wall and we write slogans all over the wall put signs up all these things come in with dead things and be a dead people but if we put God in his place first then there's no use of dedicating the building until you get God in his place right, right. amen it ain't going to be up to Brother Andrews to do it it's going to be up to every one of you as individuals to put God in his rightful place right. in his place he means more than my feelings He's more important than your feelings. He's more important than my feelings. When I get him in his rightful place, there'll be times when the smoke of the Lord will fill the place. When the smoke of the Lord, I don't know where any of y'all understand that or not. The smoke comes from something that's burned up. And when the fire of the Holy Ghost gets in enough of our lives to burn up self. You hear what I'm saying? I said when we get enough of the Holy Ghost in our lives to burn up self. There's going to be a Holy Smoke. And it's going to fill the place. People are going to come in the door and they're going to feel something that comes only from God. That's what happened right here when, when they put God's ark in its rightful place and they got it where it's supposed to be. They put him in the most holy place. A lot of folks look at me as being up here in the most holy place because I'm the pastor. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not in the most holy place. I'm under him. He's above me. 
He's always above me. His place is Lord. His place is God. <coughs> when they got him in his place, the word of the Lord, and he got into the place that he was supposed to be. The Bible said that the, uh, they, they give offering. They were so grateful that they had sacrificed to give so much that they quit count. That they couldn't count. And we, listen, you want to see a church blessed, you want to see your family, you want to see your finances blessed, quit counting what you're giving to God.
And I went and prayed. I said, oh God, you know what to do. And the Lord would just get a hold of me. This, this ought to be sacred to everybody that gets up here. Gets up here. Amen. Amen. It ought to be sacred. And sometimes, sometimes things, you know, that just happen. You know what I'm talking about? But this is, this is God's building. This is God's church. This is God's church. How many of y'all want to kind of help me break the ark and put it in trial? Go ahead. How many of you will quit worshiping in the tabernacle of Paul and Georgie? Hill Street. How many of you quit worshiping in the tabernacle of Fairman Road, the old filling station? How many of you quit worshiping in the tabernacle? Down at the bottom of the hill. And how many of you will pray and seek God and try to break that God? And that's the Holy One. Bring him away from all that. Bring him in here. Put him in his rightful place. I want the ark of the Lord to be here. I do want the ark of the Lord. Without the ark of the Lord, where there's no anointing, there's no vision. That's right. There's no glory, there's no worship, there's no praise. I don't like Jack Rabbit Pentecostal. We'll jump, shout, nothing there. Holy yo yo, up down, up down, up down, up down, up down, up down, but it ain't God. Where God is, God dwells in this tabernacle. They sung up here, Lord, let me be a temple, a sanctuary, a holy place. Let me be here. Hallelujah. I'm, you know what she said to, say to me? She said, I, she thinks I have direct contact with Jesus. And I talked to her just a few times. I won't do it. I just, you know, like the president say, she said, I want you to tell Jesus that I'm ready to thank him. <laughs> I want you to testify and tell what happened to your Lord.
what I understand, he had a big growing of beard. And he says, I don't preach against beard. I really don't. I don't think it's a sin to have a beard. I really don't. I don't think nobody has no Bible against beards. Does anybody have any? I think this Bible gets trimming them and makes them look like hot shots. But if you just let them grow like a woman let your hair grow, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't care if it goes down to your feet. But somehow or another, he just felt self-conscious about coming with that beard. And he said he could trim that beard off when he comes to church. I won't think that kind of God here. A God that would go out and talk parallel points when they're not where they ought to be. When we know that they're lagging behind, we give up on them and we're praying and receiving God. We said, God, there's our loved ones. Go touch them. Go help them, Lord. If we got somebody here in this place that we can touch by name, we call them we're on a first name basis with him. He's got so familiar with any people that we're on a first name basis with him. We don't have to go through no channels. He, just, he got tired of us going through channels and took the thing that separated us and just ripped it wide open. Said, come on in and don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of coming into the presence of God because of your sin, because my blood is standing between you and what will destroy you because of your sins. I want that in this place. I don't want people to feel like I'm not good enough to be there. You know, we have a lot of that. We have a lot of folks who want to come to they feel, well, I ain't good enough. And when I get good enough, then I'm going. It ain't going to work that way. You come to this God because you need help. They've got a person in here that didn't come to God. It wasn't a dirty, rotten sinner lost on their way to hell that needed something. You look around and you look at our past. We got, we got some dirty past. And those that don't have a dirty past, they're so dirty in their spirit now that you can't stand to be around them. I know I'm talking a long time this morning, but it's on my heart. I gotta get it out. I want to pray and tell him I want to get that God. That God that talked to you and made you get out and run around in the snow and holler. Yeah. I want I want that God here. I want I want that tabernacle moved. I want to move out of the tabernacle. I want it moved out of the tabernacle. And I want it moved into this place. I want it in here. There ought to be a place of healing in here. There ought to be a place that we can come. Granny Rollator, that God that come to you in the hospital up there. I want you to bring that God in here. Same thing with you, Granny Copeland. That God that come to you and tell him, bring him in here. Now, Lord. Yeah. God has really touched my body since I ate this week. I'm feeling better around here than three or four years. I've been touched all. God touched my body and I've been getting better ever since. I feel good. And I just pray you and I pray for the Father. Put him in his place. Bring him on in. Bring him on in. Bring him on in. Bring the word of God in. Put him in his place. I call all of you by name. I guess I'd be here all, but I could go through every one of you. There ain't not a one in here that I can't go and say, God touched you in the will of this place. God touched you in the will of this place. God touched you while, you, while it was under the tent. Now I want you, as God's people, to bring in the ark. Don't try to do it by yourself and don't try to keep it straight by yourself. Work is a church to bring it on in. When they were start, started to bring the ark in one time, it looked like it was shaking. Here with a man out done the forbidden thing. Grabbed a hold of it. Well, no, well, nobody's supposed to touch that but the priest. And this man was not a priest. And he jumped out of his place and tried to steady up the work of God. Don't you let nobody uh, don't you let the devil get a hold of you and, and tell you that, that you got all the answers to the church and, and that you're, you're, you, you're going to get things straightened out. You ain't going to get nothing straightened out. You're going to die in the process. They ain't one can straighten out nobody. I can't straighten out nobody. I look around, I see things wrong in the church. I can't straighten it out. 
None of these other preachers can't straighten it out. Only God can straighten out things that's wrong. Amen. But when we get him in his rightful place, when he's forefront, he's first in everything, then, then the glory of the Lord will fill the place. I'd like to say this to come forward. Let's say that song. Uh, Diane, there's two of them I'd like to say this morning. One of them is, is the one about lifting up our hands. And opening up our heart, and opening up our mouth. And the uh, first time I heard this, Sister Bobby Shoemaker, we all never cried and laughed all at the same time. It felt that bugging up on the inside. <laughs> Amen. I was there and everything had got dull. Some of those meetings, when, when they got a whole bunch of women, you hear a lot of talk and it begins to be rattling. And uh, it get dull. And I got dull. I had my senses dull. I was sitting there. I was ready to go get a hot dog or something to get out of the place. Find me a cocoa or potato chip or something. Bobby Shoemaker went to the piano just all of a sudden without any announcement. Oh, she started singing this song. And when she started that there song, all it left me, it just got that on the inside of me and it just pulled me up. I think we need that this morning, don't you? Why don't we stand and let's just sing this together? And I'd like for every one of you that will, while we're singing this song, I'd like for you to come and rest these altars. Just use this word as an altar. And I'd like for you to kneel. Ladies on this side and men over here on this side. And I'd like for you to Pray that God, God, let that, think about it in your life where God has blessed you out there. And pray that God will let that same blessing be in this place. <laughs> Don't worry about the building, all that other stuff is behind us, but I want that God that was with us there to be with us here. And I'd like for all of you that want that God that was with you in the hospital, that was with you everywhere, to be in this place. I would like for you to come and kneel and ask God to be in this place with us, just like he was in, with us in those other places in the world. God, we want you in the temple, just as we had you in the tabernacle. Would you say? Amen.